Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this uh, January 2018 edition of the Virtual Roundtable. Today we have Jerry Miller, who's a probably not a stranger to any of you really, but he's a business attract or retention and expansion specialist here at the Idaho Department of Commerce. Um, I guess one of many roles that Jerry's had here. Uh, so today we'll be talking about downtown revitalization and um, kind of um, how that can um, be an economic driver for your community. So um, as always, these are recorded. If you would like to share the link or access it at another time, um, please reach out to any of us here at Commerce. Um, and then if you have any questions, please type them in as they come up and Jerry will answer them. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jerry. And one other thing we'll do is uh, probably tomorrow sometime, I will take the slides that I'm going to be showing you this afternoon, throw them up on a Google Drive, and I'll shoot that link out to everybody so you can have a copy of the presentation um, if you so desire. Um, any Everybody who knows me or who's ever seen me do a presentation knows that um, I have this obsessive compulsion with doing shame plugs for other things that are going on at the Department of Commerce. So I want to start off by encouraging and then everyone to save the date, dates of July 19th through the 13th of 2018 for the Northwest Community Development Institute. Um, for those of you that are brand new to the Department of Commerce, um, this is a economic development training, community development training that we've done for the last 19 years. Um, we're part of a network of national training institutes. There's five other CDIs across the country. We're affiliated with a group called the Community Development Council. Um, and the folks that go through it come back year after year, so I think we're doing something right there. Uh, we hope to have registration information, more information up and available, oh, probably sometime in the middle towards the end of March. Um, we do offer some scholarships to the Institute, but the competition for those are, is, really, is really tight. So I would like to encourage folks who are thinking about CDEI to maybe talk to their friends um, at, the, at their respective power companies to see if there might be some scholarship opportunities there and to start you know, thinking about um, those dates and how to get there and how to pay for it. Next thing I'd like to promote is the Idaho Economic Development Association Spring Conference. It will be April 24th through the 26th in lovely Burley, Idaho. Um, this will be uh, a great opportunity to not only hear from, from experts in the field of economic development, but really to um, learn from, meet your peers from across the state. And I always found, find the value of events like AIDA and even the Northwest Community Development Institute, the main value of attending something like that isn't the learning that takes place in the sessions, but it's the learning that takes place during breaks and during lunches and just the, just the opportunity to network and bond with your, your colleagues from across the state. So invaluable um, professional development opportunity. So keep that on your calendar as well. So with that in mind, let's talk about downtown revitalization. Question that comes up a lot in economic development circles is why should we as economic developers care, be focused on, or pay any attention to downtown? The conventional thinking is if we recruit new businesses and do all the other things right, then there'll just be a bunch of there'll, there'll be a, a, a great wave or trickle down that will help and advance our downtown. Well, the reality of the situation is, is that life doesn't really work like that. First of all, every community has a downtown or some semblance of, business, of a business district. And in, in, in most cases, it's either thriving, your downtown's thriving, or your downtown's struggling. And if your downtown is struggling, that's a significant financial, social, an economic burden upon your community. The reality of the situation is, and especially in rural Idaho, is that most of our communities in rural Idaho don't have the industrial parks. They don't have the sophisticated infrastructure needed to 
to recruit and attract um, a lot of the, the manufacturing and technology opportunities that are, that are out there. So for most rural communities, your best and maybe your only asset for economic development is going to be your downtown. Second reason is that the condition of your downtown is a barometer of your overall business environment. I know of at least three instances of business attraction opportunities that were lost, not because of cost, not because of infrastructure, not because of the space available, whether it was a building or land in the industrial park. The opportunities were lost on the drive from the interstate to the actual potential site location. Those drives went through downtowns and the site selectors, or in one case, the, the uh, CEO of the company, um, just said to themselves on that drive that this isn't going to be a place that I'm going to be able to encourage my top management and my top talent to come and relocate to. So your condition your downtown says, sends a signal to your potential business clients um, that your downtown is either ready or your downtown isn't ready um, for an economic um, opportunity. Let's talk about tourism for a second. We know from um, studies that are commissioned by the uh, our tourism division that 47% of our visitors, or what we would call tourists, come to Idaho to visit friends or friends and family. The takeaway here is that you don't need to have a fancy resort in your backyard. You don't need to have a famous recreational area in your backyard to take advantage of these tourism dollars. All you need is a community that hasn't that has yet to alienate all their friends and family and has a place for those visitors to spend money. And if your downtown's dead, then those dollars are going to come that those dollars are going to just flow right through your community and into the hands of the great state of Boise, um, Napa, they'll go, go to Twin and go to some of the other larger commercial areas in the, in the state. This is probably the most important reason to care for a downtown if you're a public official, and that is the potential to expand your tax base. So when we're talking about re downtown revitalization, we're talking about buildings that are already built, and in most cases, those buildings are already sitting on top of, of existing infrastructure. So by getting businesses into those buildings and getting those buildings fixed up and rehabilitated, you are adding to your the value of those buildings and thus you're adding to your tax base without having to spend a lot of money to build a lot of new infrastructure. That's not the case when you're doing industrial parts or you're, you're trying to help a business locate on the outskirts of town. Yes, that business on the outskirts of town is going to um, contribute tax dollars, but you're going to spend a lot of tax dollars running the roads and the sewer and the infrastructure out there. So if you want a quick hit, if you want a great way to increase your, your value, increase your tax base without having to expend a lot of that tax base to get that increase in tax base in the first place, well, downtown is going to be a great, great opportunity for making that happen. There's been a lot of studies on the economics of downtown revitalization. And the slide you're looking at right now is prepared by, Don, by a guy named Donovan Ripkema, who is actually here in Boise in September. And he's done a lot of work around the country studying downtowns, Main Street communities, and historic districts. And what he has found consistently across the country, whether it's in Iowa, in Michigan, in New Mexico, in Georgia, um, just about everywhere he's, he's studied, he has found that historic districts that are curated, meaning historic districts that communities take pride in and, and take care of, and downtowns that are vibrant and where, where the communities have partnerships between um, the public sector and the private sector to care and nurture those downtowns, those buildings per square foot will produce more economic value than any other type of development in your community. He in particular looked at downtown districts in Iowa and Michigan over the course of the Great Recession. And what he found in Iowa 
is that not only did those downtown district those downtown districts their property values actually went up when everybody else's property values in the state is going down the study also determined that over the last 25 years that the state of Iowa has been doing a Main Street program in terms of jobs, in terms of capital investment, and in terms of, and in terms of return on investment, the Main Street program has outperformed all the other elements of Iowa's economic development program. So Main Street in Iowa has outperformed business business attraction. It's out it's outperformed business their traditional business retention expansion programs, and that perform their tourism programs in terms of generating business and value and economic activity. So how do we get people back into our downtowns? Well, I like to think of it as solving the puzzle, and I call this the puzzle of the big box of value. So these are the types of businesses that live in the big box of value, and I don't care how much money you make, Everybody shops in this big box of value. All you have to do is walk through the Winco parking lot on a Saturday or Sunday morning, and you will see late model BMWs and Mercedes Benzes parked next to rusted out Chevys and Fords. So the question becomes, how do we get customers to take an occasional detour and to take or an occasional step outside of that this box of or outside of the big box of value? Well, for starters, we need to create a fun, positive experience. That starts with offering excellent cu customer service in the restaurants and the shops that are in our downtown areas, but it also includes development of great third spaces. And when we talk about third space, we're talking about a place like maybe a, a, a coffee shop or even benches outside, a pocket park, just places where people are allowed to and encouraged to just come and hang out. The idea is that if you, the longer you can get people to linger, the more opportunity your businesses are going to have to capture those dollars. Think about going to a movie or going to a sporting event, and think about what you pay for a concession at that sporting event. What that tells us is that when people are having a good time, they're willing to spend money, and they're willing to spend, spend more money on things that they normally wouldn't spend money on if they weren't having a great time. So creating that fun, positive experience in your downtown area is the first step in, in solving this big box of value puzzle. The next is to have uh, businesses that provide quality goods, specialty goods, activities, and services. There's no way that a, a Ma and Pa downtown business is going to be able to compete with Winco when it comes to selling milk, bread, and other staple type grocery items. But if that Ma and Pa store is selling high end cheese, fancy wines, um, they're going to be able to capture business that's not going into the Winco's. I want to really hit emphasize the point that you really need to have activity, a good mix of activities and services in your downtown. The most brilliant project I've seen in the last 20 years uh, done in a downtown area are the library projects that have been built in Lewiston and in Napa. Think about a library. A library attracts individuals from all walks of life. They attract old people, they attract young people, they attract families, they, att they attract uh, uh, single people, people who like books, people who like to use technology, people who like to um, ha have, have camaraderie, camaraderie with others in their, in their community. Um, libraries pull people in oftentimes maybe once a week, twice a week, three times a week. That fancy wine shop or that fancy dress shop, that might pull somebody into downtown maybe once, maybe twice a year. So having that good mix of, of, of uh, businesses and activities and services is a great way to generate those multiple trips that give your businesses in the downtown district a greater opportunity at capturing consumer dollars. 
Last but not least, and this is probably the most important point I can make during this webinar, is that our businesses need to be in the downtown core, need to be convenient, and they need to be easy to find. The biggest sin a downtown business can make is to be closed on Sunday and to close the doors before six o'clock in the evening. Studies show that most consumer spending take pl takes place on the weekends and after six o'clock. Who in the right mind would go into their savings account, take out 40% of their savings account in cash, pour gasoline on it, and set it on fire? Well, if you're a downtown business and you're closing your doors at five and you're not open on the weekends, that is exactly what you're doing. It amazes me, it shocks me, it surprises me every time I go to some of our rural communities, especially those that are that have the fancy resorts in their backyard or maybe on the beaten path to a national park known for its geyser and to have their businesses closed on Sunday. It just is it, it, it's just mind blowing the amount of cash that they're letting flow through their fingers by not being open when, when people want, want to shop, want to find them. The other thing is that you need to be easy to find. And in this day and age, the way you get to be easily found is by being on social media, being on the internet. There's a lot of great research show, showing that the, ma the, the small independent retail sector is growing while the big box stores, the Macy's, the Sears, the Kmart's of the world are dying. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the reasons that there's growth in the independent retail sector is that those independent retailers over the last few years have gotten very good and very savvy about using social media. In fact, there's a lot of research that suggests that um, a certain segment of a uh, of, of shopper will start their search research by looking at stuff on a at, on a website like Amazon or the other shopping websites out there. They'll see something that that tricks their 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 eye, and because they live in Idaho or they live in another area where they don't get next day shipping via Amazon Prime where it's two days or maybe three days, and but they want that good right away, what they will do then is they will search that good online and they will look for the closest place to where they live that offers that good or service online. So if your business isn't online and you're not letting people know what kinds of goods and services you have available, you're losing business. And it's business that you don't know you're losing because you're not there online. Let's talk math. The rule of three, the rule of three says, and there's a lot of research to back this up, is that people will spend most of their discretionary income within three miles of where they live. Now that might be a little, that, that radius might be a little bit bigger when we get into our rural communities where, you know, what you need is a little bit further out than three miles. The takeaway there is that uh, as much as we can offer in our downtowns, that is going to help stop dollars from leaking out of our communities. It also sends a signal that in order for us to have successful downtowns, we need to have people living in the downtowns or we need to have people living close to our downtowns. Um, it's, it saddens me when I see all these apartments being built way out in the outskirts of our cities. Um, and a lot of times it's not necessarily that that's where they want to go, but a lot of times it's that's where the zoning says they have to go. Our zoning doesn't allow denser development near and adjacent to our downtown areas. We need to do something to change that, um, to, to take advantage of that impulse, that human impulse, that human human behavior of, of where they spend money. The, the four to one ratio is a Roger Brooks concept. And the idea here is that for every hour you want somebody to drive to come to your community, 
you need to offer them four hours worth of activity. So the takeaway here is that we have to have that good mix of goods and services and things to do in our downtown. Additionally, we need to associate our communities with our tourism industry and the activities that are, may not necessarily be in your downtown, but are in close proximation to your downtown. Great example is the, is the uh, city of Kimberly out in the Magic Valley. We did a community review there last spring, and we found that doing just a little bit of research um, and just talking, and talking to, to folks, that they are right in the center of the hub of a lot of different activities. It is actually easier to get to Shoshone Falls by taking by going taking the second Twin Falls exit and going by Kimberly than it is to come through Twin Falls. It's easier to access the South Hills recreation area by going through Kimberly. Kimberly has lots of farm to market paved flat roads that are ideal perfect for bicyclists. So there was a lot of recreation taking a place around Kimberly. And hopefully we gave them some ideas on how they could take advantage of that, tie into that, and, and help build up their business community by, by networking into that. The Power 10, the Power 10 simply says in order to have a successful downtown, you need to have 10 different restaurants, or retail type businesses, um, period, to be successful. The idea there is that you, if you get that good mix, then you generate frequent trips to your downtown. Um, if you get people to linger, then they linger and they wander in and out of the businesses and everybody benefits. And then the 10 by 10 by 10 theory, once again, this is another thing that I've stolen from Roger Brooks. And the idea there is that in order for a downtown district to be successful, you need to have 10 rest, at least 10 restaurants, 10 shops, and 10 of those restaurants and shops need to be opened um, after six and ideally till eight or nine o'clock at night at the very least. So here are my four commandments for having a successful downtown. First of all, your effort needs to be comprehensive. You can't just fix the sidewalks call it good, and expect your downtown to suddenly thrive and survive. You need to hit on all cylinders. Yes, you need to do those public, those public infrastructure, those public space things, but you also need to work with your businesses to help them work smarter and adapt to the changing retail environment. You need to have events going on in your downtown frequently, things that bring people to the, to the core, downtown core and keep them there. It's that concept, again, of getting them to linger longer. And you need to be organized, and it needs to be a comprehensive partnership between public sector, private sector, and the community at large. The other thing we know from our tourism studies, where our visitors spend money is based on word of mouth. And so if you are not appealing to the locals in your community, then you're not going to be able to, to capture that word of mouth tourism spending. Like I said, it needs to be collaborative. It can't be just a business problem. It can't be just a, a public sector or city problem. It needs to engage, you need to engage your entire community um, in your downtown improvement efforts. It needs to be authentic. Um, if people wanted McDonald's, then they wouldn't go on vacation to begin with because they got McDonald's in their backyard. <laughs> when people travel, they want an authentic, unique experience. Um, so keep that in mind when you're, you're planning your downtown revitalization efforts. And to be successful and sustainable over time, it needs to be incremental. This is not something you can do as a quick fix. It's not something you can do overnight. So if you follow those four points, you'll, you have a very good opportunity of having a successful downtown. So let's talk about some of the ideas for creating successful downtown. I want to start with the physical. I want to start with public spaces. We want to have multiple use public spaces in our downtowns. So a multiple, an example of a multiple use public space might be a parking lot or a street that during, that during the week is a parking lot and a street. 
but maybe on the weekends is where farmer mar farmers market takes place, where festivals take place, where arts events takes place, uh, where events happen that encourage people to linger longer. Next thing we want under downtowns is we want public art. Why public art? Well, first, public art encourages people to get out of the cars and walk around and and look at stuff. So once again, it's that linger longer. If you get only one concept out of the, today's presentation, make that be linger longer, LL. Mm -hmm. um, and what you see in the in the photo here is a great example of public art. Um, it's an art piece. It's a function piece. You know, people could sit there, take take a rest. Um, they could play backgammon. Um, off outside of the photo, there's another bench just like this with a checkerboard, and it's also a think piece. So the inscription on that particular bench there is a quote from Albert Einstein that says, logic will take you from A to B, imagination will take you everywhere. And that sits right outside the, the Lewiston Public Library. Uh, that really caught my eye, and I thought that was really neat. You want to make sure that you're, if possible, to do the best you can to have your high traffic public services in your downtown core. That means if you're building, a, if you're you're planning to relocate City Hall or do a new City Hall, have that be in your downtown. Get your libraries in their downtown. One thing I wanted to, I forgot to mention about libraries, is that in most communities they are the de facto visitor center, and that's because most libraries have free Wi-Fi. And so when people are, especially if they're doing road trips and they're coming into town, one of the first things they may want to do is check their email. And if they're like my dad, who's too cheap to get a data plan, first thing he's going to do is find the library so, so he could use the Wi-Fi to check his email and other, and other messages. Um, but the, the other thing about having public services in your downtown is that we know in a lot of our Idaho communities, most of our workers commute outside of our communities. So that 3,000 plus population in Kimberly, between the hours of eight and five, Monday through Friday, that becomes about a 1,500 person community because everybody um, commutes to work. So if we can have those public services in our downtown, that can offset to a certain extent the traffic that we're losing um, from the folks who are commuting outside of the city to work. Infrastructure. Um, most downtowns have infrastructure, but might need some repairs here and there. Um, part of the key to success is having places where people want to hang out, where they feel safe, and having your infrastructure up to speed and up to snuff um, helps advance that cause. Trees. Seems kind of odd, but you know, trees can, can really have lots of benefits for a downtown. First of all, depending on where they're planted and if they're strategically planted, they can help They can help with energy cost. And each of the big three power companies in Idaho have staff people who will come out and help you decide what kind of tree and where to put it would be the help, help you um, get the best, the best economic value out of having that tree um, near your house or in your community. Second thing three, trees do is that trees help extend the life of pavement. Sidewalks that are shaded last longer than sidewalks that are not. And the third thing, and there's studies to back this up, is that trees have a calming effect on drivers. So think of trees as a, as a natural way to slow people down without having the scary police and the threats of tickets and that sort of thing to get them to slow down. Here's some examples of public spaces. This is an old photo of Lloyd Square. Since then, they've what you see there is a parking lot they've turned into a park area, so that's now green space. But um, this was a, this this is an area that served as a parking lot during the day and then gathering space at night and on the weekends. Um, what you see on the left, that building there in the background was part of the old lumber yard with, that was there. They put in a stage. There's power. There's restrooms. So when there's an event, they roll the doors up, and when they're in an event, an event they roll the doors down. Um, there's a power outlet that's accessible when that stage isn't open. Um, last time I was there in Lloyd Square, there was a young man with a guitar and his amp plugged in, and he was just jamming away, and it, it created kind of a nice ambiance for our, our visit there to, to Nampa. And then the picture on the right is the shot from the, from the stage. A lot of the hot springs. 
Um, they are uh, one of the communities on the Oregon Trail. And so when they did this bench project, they wanted to incorporate that heritage, that authenticness of their community into this project. And so they have these benches along their main street. And most of these benches are under awnings or some sort of shade. So they've done, you know, they, they do did a good job there of creating something that encourages people to linger longer. My Uncle Max would love this place. Because what he could do is he could sit on the bench with his cup of coffee, all the young ladies that go by, tell lies about fishing, about his fishing exploits. And while he's doing that, my Aunt Helen can be raging, ra raging through the stores, spending all the money, um, all their all their money for the month um, on all kinds of knickknacks and goods and services. If that linger space wasn't there, Uncle Max would be grumpy. Aunt Helen wouldn't have a chance to drop the, uh, the <laughs> okay. drop the money. So that's uh, kind of what we're getting at. Um, this is another great example. It's here in Boise. It's Freak Alley. It's an alley where um, that used to be plagued by graffiti and instead they decided, well, let's turn this over to artists and let's give the graffiti artists a chance to do something that's really artistic. And so during the day in downtown Boise, during the week, you'll see trucks in here and you'll see delivery guys and you'll see all kinds of work activity going on. On the weekends, you'll see people just taking a nice stroll through here, admiring the art. Um, there's a similar alley up in Sandpoint, um, and they use chalk up there in their alley as opposed to paint that we use down here in this alley. Another great example of creating exciting public spaces and public art, once again, from Lewiston. Um, there was a music store that was going out of business. They had a couple old pianos that they couldn't sell. They, they donated them to the Downtown Association. They got the pianos tuned up. They put some paint on the pianos, some, some weather-resistant paint. And now you'll see these pianos in various locations in downtown Lewiston, secured with block light, uh, bike locks so they don't roll away or, or <laughs> somehow disappear. Um, but it's not uncommon to see a couple street musicians putting on a great show um, in downtown Lewiston during the summer. So we got all these great public space kinds of things we might want to do in our community. How do we pay for these sort of things? Well, there's a few resources out there, and I'm going to have a handout that I'll throw on the Google Drive that'll have a lot more resources. Um, but for starters, um, it would be remiss if I didn't mention and shamelessly plug the Idaho Community Development Block Grant Program. Um, each year, we set aside oh, somewhere between a million dollars, sometimes a million and a half, and if it's, uh, we have lots of really good projects, we can maybe go as high as two, but uh, we set aside some of our block grant funds for, um, for downtown revitalization projects. You larger communities that are on entitlement funds, you can definitely do, do downtown projects with your CDBG dollars um, under the slum and blight category. You just need to make sure that you talk to the people who control the purse strings for those dollars and make sure your projects get into their, their planning um, efforts. Crowdfunding is a, is a good way to fund projects. I wouldn't rely on crowdfunding to do a half million dollar, multi-million dollar downtown revitaliz revitalization. But if you're trying to do something simple, maybe maybe an art piece, maybe a little pocket park, or you know, a memorial to a community member or to veterans, then crowdfunding is a definite way to go. Um, urban renewal, um, a lot of the great downtown revitalization efforts we've seen here in Idaho have been partially funded by urban renewal. Um, oftentimes, urban renewal will generate negative thoughts in our head because we get all, all caught up with the whole idea of, of um, tax increment financing. But keep in mind that tax increment financing is only part of urban renewal. There are a lot of other things that urban renewal um, prod programs can do. Urban renewal agencies can own property, they can take out mortgages, they can lease property, which collects rents to help pay off those mortgages and generates revenue streams um, for, for the do even further urban renewal efforts. Local improvement districts are a quick way to do small infrastructure improvements in your downtown, so sidewalks. Um, lighting, those kinds of things can be easily done with local improvement. Well, I shouldn't say easily done, but can be done with local improvement districts. The thing that I like about local improvement districts is they don't require a citywide vote. 
Um, they allow those being assessed to pay off those assessments over time. They don't incur any, any debt obligation upon the city. So it's a great way to pay, have neighborhoods or have individual property owners within individual blocks pay for infrastructure improvements without having that burden imposed upon the community as a whole. And definitely, if you're doing downtown projects, especially in the public space, leverage, leverage, leverage. One of the things with our block rent dollars we encourage communities to do is to find out if there's a, a state highway going through their downtown, and most of our downtowns have state highways going through them, is to find out when ITD is going to be going through there to do a rebuild on the street. That way, you're only, downtown's torn up only once. Um, you're only digging up the street once. It may um, generate some savings for the city, being able to piggyback upon the work that ITD is doing. Parking. No conversation I've ever had with downtown. Um, I never had a conversation about downtown with anybody where parking didn't come up. So when you're thinking about parking in downtown, first of all, make sure your, your parking spaces, your on-street parking spaces are clearly marked. Um, oftentimes I'll go into a community and I'll see three cars parallel parked on a block that could easily accommodate five cars if there were simply little stripes on the, on the pavement directing people where to park. Make sure your parking spaces are easy to find. Um, I think every community review I've ever done, um, we've had people raise the issue of parking. Um, only for us as a visiting team to go out and do some looking around and counting and finding that they had way more parking spaces than what people were telling us they had in a survey um, or in just casual conversations with folks. A lot of our downtowns um, will have off-street parking. They'll be parking behind buildings that's not very well signed. Um, people don't know it exists. So there's a perceived parking problem um, where there really isn't. There's always going to be those one or two spots in front of the post office, in front of the senior center <laughs> that everybody wants. So don't be afraid to regulate those prime spots. It doesn't have to be a meter. It could be a 15-minute zone. Um, oftentimes, if you just have the sign out there that suggests that you shouldn't park more than 15 minutes, that sign alone is enough to keep that uh, parking space available to lots of people during the day. And a lot of our visitors to Idaho do so in land yachts and RVs. So something to think about as we're doing our downtown revitalization project is um, figure out if there's a space in downtown that could, could accommodate RV, our RVs and um, designate it so and encourage people to bring their RVs into downtown. A great example of a community that has done something along these lines is the city of Buell. Um, they have a couple of RV parking, day parking spots right next to their chamber building slash visitor center. It's within a block, block and a half walking distance of their downtown. I just thought that was a really, really neat thing for our community to have and to think about um, putting in into place. Confusing signs, <laughs> let's be careful about if we're going to restrict parking, how we communicate that message um, to, to, to people. Um, if you think you have a parking problem, before you just go out and willy-nilly decide that you need to build parking lots or parking structures, really study, study, study the problem. Oftentimes, the issue with parking isn't the lack of parking spaces, but it's usually the demand for those few key parking spaces that might be um, in front of the post office, in front of the senior center, in front of the cafe, et cetera. Um, try education campaigns, encouraging your businesses to not have their employees park in front of the prime spots that are most likely to be used and desired by customers. Um, I think you will often find that your parking, um, that your parking is underutilized in your communities. And it might just be a simple, simple measure of letting people know where that parking is and where that additional parking is. Um, if you're planning to do on-street parking, if it's possible and workable, it's not always workable when you have a state highway coming through, but if you can do angled parking, um, 
that's a great parking scheme for a downtown. Um, it does a couple things. First of all, our angled parking maximizes the number of cars you can put in front of a building, um, but it also has a traffic calming effect um, in that if people see a, a car that is perpendicular to them, they're more likely to slow down than they are a car that is parallel to them. When we see parallel cars, we have that urge to, to get our NASCAR on and to pass them. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's, there's that safety aspect of it as well. As a general rule, three to five spots for a thousand square feet of retail space is usually what um, the experts, the downtown planning experts will suggest. And can you have too much parking? The answer is yes. Um, my economist friend, Donovan Ritkama, estimates that a parking spot costs the community $500 a year in opportunity costs. So a parking spot is a spot that doesn't have anything on it because there's nothing on it. You're not getting high value. You're not getting high value, um, the most value um, out, out of that land or out of that space um, in your downtown. So a lot of our downtowns, we have old buildings that need, that need some TLC. Um, what are some strategies to get those buildings up and running? Excellent example out of the Magic Valley in Eastern Idaho's Operation Facelift. What they do there is they organize volunteers, they pick a weekend, they pick a couple buildings, and they spruce up the outside of those buildings. And what they have found is that if you have a block full of ugly buildings, you're going to have a block full of ugly buildings. But nobody wants to be the ugly building on the block. <laughs> so if you fix up one or two buildings on the block, you don't want to be the ugliest building on the block. So that entices property owners. Um, to um, go even further and fix up their buildings so they're not the, the sore thumb of the, the community. A good place to start for building owners, and I recommend this um, for folks who don't have a lot of money, is to start with energy efficiency improvements on buildings. So most power companies have energy efficient, efficiency programs. What they will do is they will send out experts that will do a walkthrough with you and give you some ideas on what you can do um, to make your buildings more energy efficient. They also have incentives and discounts and resources, as does the state. The state has some tax incentives, and the state has a, 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 uh, a, low, a low interest. It's 4% interest. The uh, loan application is two pages. Um, it's an energy efficiency rehabilitation program. There's one for residences. There's one for commercial buildings. The great thing about doing an energy efficiency improvement and starting there is that produces immediate savings and that could produce then a cash flow or stop the bleeding, if you would, and free up some money that could then be reinvested in doing some of the other improvements in a building. Code enforcement, um, you know, this one is politically charged. Um, um, Council members, mayors fear doing code enforcement for fear of being voted out of office. Um, but this is this can be a powerful tool. Um, city of Soda Springs had a new mayor uh, come in last few years. Um, he wanted to clean up the town. He worked with the council to beef up the city's code enforcement rules and laws. Um, they haven't had to enforce those rules and laws yet. Just the simple act of that public gesture of saying, hey, we, we want to fix up our town, we want our town to look nicer, and we're going to put some teeth in the law to, to make that happen, was enough to entice people to voluntarily, on their own, without having any conversations with law enforcement or code enforcement, to clean up properties. This is an idea that I've seen used back east quite a bit in some Main Street communities. Um, the idea here with the facade easement is that you have a, a, a block of buildings and all the property owners on that block uh, agree to um, sign an easement for X amount of years to a public entity, a city, a county, um, a nonprofit um, business development association. And in return, then that, and that public entity or that nonprofit entity will then come in and they'll do facade re improvements on those buildings. Because those easement or those facades, the, those organizations have easements on those facades, that allows in some cases public money to be spent 
And in fact, he saved some community development block grant money for these types of projects because the facade suddenly, become, they're not privately owned anymore, they're publicly owned. So that might be a, an idea that might be worth exploring, exploring in your communities. And some, some Main Street communities, some downtown associations will have revolving loan funds where they'll give out small loans to help uh, with signage or to help um, building owners fix up their, their buildings and their facilities. I want to show you a, a couple examples of some building rehabilitation projects in Idaho. Um, hey, it's not a Main Street community, but they've attended some of our Main Street trainings, and I think this was the inspiration. That was the inspiration for this project. So this is the Creighton building there on Main Street. This is the before picture. They pulled off and exposed the brick again and, and did some touch-up, redid the awning, and voila, you can see, see the difference. Picture on the left, empty. When they started pulling off the, 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 the metal there, um, somebody was interested, and even before this project was done, um, there was a tenant ready to rent out that, that building, at least the, the, the first floor of that building. This is one of my favorite projects of all time, the Wilson Theater in Rupert. And, then, and once again, they, they did this incrementally. They, just, they didn't do this overnight. So on the left side of your screen, um, on the lower level, these are actually office spaces. And this is where they targeted their rehab efforts first. Why did they target this, these office spaces first? Well, they figured that if we had a couple offices there that we would, could rent out, that would generate some income that we could use to help um, get our project up and going. Phase two, there's some meeting rooms and conference rooms on the, le on, on the left side of your, of your screen there, on the top floor. Once again, their thought, Let's get some meeting space up there. Let's get something we can rent out and generate some income. They did a lot of fundraising, a lot, a lot of grants to do the outside work. They had to have some special specialty artisans and craftsmen come in and do that, that outside restoration. They were fortunate enough to have on their board a judge. And this happened to be the judge that handled most of the juvenile cases in um in in in, in Minidoka County, and so there were a lot of of, of uh, youth who had community service hours to work off that spent those worked those hours off in the Wilson Theater. So there was a lot of volunteer effort, a lot of sweat equity has gone into that into the interior of that facility to to get that fixed up and up and running. And now it's one of the, the jewels of the Northwest. And it's a it's a an example of a project when people around the state come to us and they say, hey, we got this old theater here. We want to think uh, fix up. We send them the we send them the Rupert to talk to the folks at the Wilson. And nobody in the room that I'm that's here with me in the room, with the exception of myself, is old enough to remember Montgomery Wards, or probably has he walked into a Montgomery Wards or shopped at a Mo Montgomery Wards. Mm -hmm. But this was a big, this is an Idaho Falls. This was just once a big box retail store, and, and um, they've done a nice job of fixing it up. There's, uh, there's uh, retail and restaurant establishments on the ground floor, and then office spaces, I believe, on, on the second floor. Housing is an important component of downtown revitalization. We're, you're hear, we're hearing a lot in the news. We're seeing a lot in publications saying that millennials want to live downtown and baby boomers want to live downtown and in the next few years, Gen Xers are going to want to follow the baby boomers downtown. Um, but don't just assume whatever housing unit units or housing scheme you put in or near your downtown is going to automatically be attractive to both, both segments. Keep in mind that each of those demographic segments, millennials and baby boomers, they want different things from their living spaces in their living environment. So if you're putting up a structure and you're going to market it to millennials, but there's no bars, there's no restaurants, there's no kinds of tattoo shops and the kinds of things that millennials like, like to do and like to patronize, it's not going to be successful. Likewise, if your downtown is full of those types of act activities and opportunities and you're putting up a building to attract Baby boomers, well, you might not be successful. Kinds of things that the baby boomers like is they like art. 
Um, they like uh, you know certain types of dining, but they like to be relatively close and be able to walk to get to get um, goods that they need to be able to either have, conveniently catch public transportation or to be easily accessible to healthcare and so and the other things that they need. So before you get aggressive and put up try to put up a big housing project in your downtown, kind of know what your downtown has to offer and then target that housing to a certain demographic segment. Um, mixed use developments are probably the best for a downtown, um, downtown housing. Um, the advantage of having a mixed use building is first of all, um, it's attracted to developers because you have multiple types of revenue coming into it. You're not just relying solely on renters and on, um, but you're not also solely re re relying on, on shop owners and restaurateurs and, and that sort of thing. Um, you might want to and need to take a look at your building codes and adjust them appropriately to make it easier to do housing in downtown. I'm not saying that you need to weaken your, your health and safety codes and your standards, um, but there might be some laws and rules on the books that were there in the 70s and they made perfect sense in the 70s and they don't necessarily make good sense now. And then whatever you can do in, to incentivize house, housing in your downtown is a good thing. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have cities, your cities, you know, offer up dollars and goodies and those kinds of things, but partner up with groups like the Idaho Housing and Finance Association and other housing developers to come up with creative ways to get housing up and going in your downtown. Marketing. Marketing is a critical, critical must-have for a downtown revitalization. It begins with branding, but uh, remember this, branding is what people say about you behind your back when you're not around. A brand, a brand is that, um, is what you use to communicate that message you want to send to the public. So the picture on the right you see, that's, that's the branding promotion, one of the branding promotional tools for, uh, for downtown Preston. Your best marketing is going to be word of mouth. In these days, where we're hit with so many, so much advertising from everywhere, we're bombarded with it. Word of mouth is the one that still breaks through. It's the most sin sincere. It's the, it's the type of advertising that people um, um, respect the most and resonate the most. Once again, I want to emphasize that our businesses need to be on social media. Um, there's something that the folks at the Harvard Business School call the Yelp effect. And what they have found is that a, a ma, a pa, an independent business that is on social media and actively engages in social media um, can take away, as, and they studied specifically McDonald's, can take away anywhere from 2 to 5% of business away from a nationally branded, nationally chained um, uh, business. McDonald's losing 2 to 5% of the business at a specific location not going to hurt them too much. Two to five percent of McDonald business going through a mom pa restaurant, that's huge. That is huge. Cooperative marketing, um, there's, there's um, uh, many hands make light work. Um, very few uh, businesses in a, in a independent businesses, small businesses have the budget to do TV advertising, social media, big social media buys, those kinds of things. But if you pull all your money together, pool your resources together, you can do great things. And something that communities uh, more and more are doing is something called a passport program. So the idea here is that you give a shopper uh, a piece of paper and then they have to go into individual businesses and get that piece of paper stamped. Um, once they have their passport all stamped and they write down their name, their address, their phone number, their email address, they throw that in for a drawing. What that does is that does a couple things. First of all, it encourages that potential customer to go in and engage with the business owner or the, or the people who are operating the business. So it gives you that one-on-one -on -one chance to make the sale. More importantly, it gives you their contact information so when they're 
So when they're not in your in your office or or excuse me in your shop, maybe they're in a different town. They go home. You can maybe entice them to come back with special deals, special offers. Or if you're one of these dual threat businesses that sells goods both in the shop and on the internet, then that gives you an opportunity to to make additional sales to those folks, even though they may be miles and miles away from your community. Let's talk about events and getting events going in your downtown. Um, the first rule of setting up downtown events is you don't poach existing events from other organizations. If the chamber does the Christmas parade, you let the chamber continue to do the Christmas parade. Try to think of and create events on those days and in those times in the calendar when there's nothing else going on in your community. Know your audience, know your, your market. A farmer's market that starts at nine o'clock in the morning, beer tent's probably not gonna be, well, maybe in Moscow, but um, most places that beer tent, uh, you're not gonna wanna have that beer tent for your, for your morning event. Um, if your community is, uh, a community where there's lots of kids, lots of family, well, then, you know, that's going to, should skew you to do those, you know, types of events that are friendly to that type of audience. Um, if it's an audience where it's a single family household and lots of millennials, um, you know, you, you do it, you maybe do different events. I would make the case that there's room in your downtowns for all kinds of events for all kinds of people, not necessarily all on the same day. Um, you know, just brainstorm, think about what those are, and then do those. Um, strategize, set goals, set metrics. Um, you know, the first couple of years you do an event, eh, you know, I wouldn't sweat too much the numbers, but once you have that baseline, then you think about ways to grow those numbers. Um, one thing that I encourage communities to do if they're, when they're doing events and they're bringing in vendors to so like a farmer's market or maybe some sort of music event where they're bringing in food trucks and other types of vendors, is have a written agreement with those vendors for them to share with you their sales um, and their revenues that they generated from your event. So that way, when you're planning future events or you're planning to do this event again next year, um, it gives you a good baseline as to how much economic impact that that event has had on your community. And that might um, quell some of the naysayers who, well, I don't like all this noise and all these people coming into our town. Be brave. Um, don't be afraid to experiment. Um, back where I'm from, uh, there's a there's a Main Street uh, district. Um, they had their farmers market on Saturday morning, same time everybody else did. Um, didn't get a, a big audience. Uh, decided that they were going to move their farmers market from Saturday to Wednesday at two o'clock in the afternoon. And now that event is the biggest weekly event in the Des Moines metropolitan mm -hmm. area on Wednesday afternoons. Mm -hmm. They go from two to eight. They usually have live music that starts about five o'clock. Um, they draw tens of thousands of people. Pitfalls events, um, make sure if you're gonna have vending opportunities, make sure those vending opportunities are offered first to your businesses that are already in your downtown area and don't recruit vendors that will compete with businesses that are already exist in your area. Always have backup plans and contingencies. You know, what if it rains? What if it's really cold? What if ESPN decides to change the uh, time and kick off for the Boise State game? Um, be ready for whatever contingencies that are out there. Uh, make sure you have plenty of insurance to cover your events. And also keep in mind some of the other liabilities that might be out there. So if it's a music event, do some research and see if you're required to pay after fees, licensing fees um, for, for use of music, um, those sort of things. Best strategy is to get sponsors for all your events. So that way, if an event doesn't turn out the, uh, as, if you don't get the audience that you planned for and you're relying on attendees to help cover the cost of the event, you're covered. Last but not least, let's talk about strategies for helping grow our downtown businesses. First and foremost is education. You know, maybe do a brown, maybe do a lunch, a lunch meeting, or maybe even better yet, a breakfast meeting a couple times a year where you bring in a speaker on topics that will help your businesses um, operate better. 
don't be afraid, encourage a cross promotion. Um, make sure once again that your businesses are, are adopting customer friendly hours. It's better to be open 10 to 8 than it is for, uh, from 8 to 5. Uh, those Saturday hours, and I know it's tough for some communities, long held traditions and customs, um, but especially with the way our, our work schedules are and the way our economies are, that's, those Sunday hours are crucial um, to, being, to having a successful business and successful environment. Um, and then make sure that those businesses are aware of e-commerce opportunities or at the very least are trying to capture contact information with their customers so that way they can market to them directly. Um, a few other tips, um, businesses that encourage businesses that sell in goods to maybe offer experiences. So maybe there's an ice cream shop in, in, your, in your downtown, doesn't do a lot of business in the winter for obvious reasons, maybe they get into the birthday business. Um, maybe there's an art supply store, they offer painting classes, those kinds of things. Um, shared space and cooperative spaces, this is a trend that's uh, becoming more and more popular. Um, some examples of that might be a building, a restaurant space that actually is home to two restaurants. So it's a breakfast slash lunch place in the morning and then an entirely different owner comes in and takes over the space at night and does, does a dinner business. Um, once again, look at the, your, your local laws and regulations and see if there's some things there that are outdated that you can get rid of to make it easier for businesses to get started, for businesses to expand, for businesses to get up and running. And um, connect your businesses to, to all the lending programs that are out there. Um, SBA loans, uh, loans through the Economic Development District, revolving loan funds, those sort of crowdsourcing those sort of things to help them grow. So with that, here's just some examples of downtown resources. Like I said, I'm gonna put up a handout on a Google Drive that will give you links to these and contact names and that sort of thing. So with that, I'm gonna cut it off there. I'm gonna turn it back over to Miss Amanda. Let her run the Thank you. there. We'll see if anybody had any questions. Uh, I'm glad you put the resources back up there because I'm going to try and plug those again. <laughs> yeah. second. So um, I don't see any questions. Nobody's typing me in. I'm coming to see. Um, oh, a uh, comment from Tina. Thank you. One of your best presentations. So. Well, thank you, Tina. Just one shameless plug here before we we shut her down for the afternoon is that um, the state of Idaho um, participates in the National Main Street Program. There's information about that on our website. Um, I ran out of time um, to talk about that this afternoon. So if you're interested in that, um, feel free to give me a call at any time and we'll have a conversation about the program and how that might be a benefit or how we might be able to engage your community in that in that national program. Uh, we do have one question here. How do you work with a downtown that is very spread out? Uh, with a downtown that's very spread out, what you do is you maybe start one block at a time or two blocks at a time. A lot of these downtown revitalization efforts, they start with a single project on a single block. Once you get a successful project on that block and people see the success of that project, um, then they're more likely to, to, to volunteer themselves, and that gives you the momentum and the resources to, to, to spread out and to take on more complicated, more complex projects. See, there are a couple other people with their hands up. Um, we can't unmute. Oh, here we go. Just type your questions into the bottom. So here's another question. With local improvement districts, does it have to be all or none? Do you know that answer? Uh, it doesn't have to be all or none. Um, I forget what the exact uh, percentages are. Um, there and, and there's, yeah, there's a couple ways you can make those happen under Idaho code. 
Um, one is if a certain percentage of the property owners um, within a local, a potential local improvement district boundary want the project, um, they can then petition the city to, to, to have one imposed. Um, there's another standard if they are not property owners but um, operate or exist or have an interest in, in the local improvement district. I forget what those are right off the top of my head, but I can circle back around with you and, and look that up and get back to you on that. Okay. I think that might be all we have for questions. Um, thank you everyone for attending. If you um, have any other questions or need anything else, you can contact uh, Jerry Miller at jerry.miller at commerce.idaho.gov. And I can also help field any questions at amanda.ames at commerce.idaho.gov. So um, again, these are recorded. So if you would like to access this again or share it with anyone, please just contact either Jerry or I, and uh, we will make sure you get it. Uh, and on that note, we are trying to get these up on our website, so they're all just kind of in one place um, and easy to access kind of whenever you need to. So um, we're getting there. All right. Thank you all very much.